Good evening, everyone. Welcome to American University in webinar format. <laughs> this is our July webinar for New Eagle families, and we're so glad that you're here with us. Um, it might be 7 p.m. where you are, or you might be in another time zone, but we're so glad you're here. My name is Samantha Carruth. I'm the Associate Director for Family Engagement in the New Student Family Programs Office. And I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Julia Gibson. And we are very pleased to introduce you to our Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services, Dr. Bridget Trogdon, who's going to present our webinar this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you all here. Um, I, I can't see all of your faces because we're in webinar mode just to try to help things come across more clearly. Um, but I'm really glad to get to talk to you all tonight. I am going to go ahead and pull up some visual aids, um, which you will also have access to. And so uh, the our, our colleagues are going to drop it in the chat. And I've also got this up. I'll show it to you in just a minute. So if you didn't know what you're in for, um, this is a session that's just all about academics. So I'm an academic and this is an academic piece. And so we really want you to think about, you know, helping your students start and stay strong academically. Um, so I am Bridget Trogdon, uh, Dean of Undergraduate Education and Academic Student Services, and I'm also a professor. So I've been a professor for 20 years, or this is this is year 20, um, and I've worked at three different institutions, but always focused quite a bit on undergraduate students and on the ways that we support them. Um, my PhD is in chemistry. And I have taught pretty much everything in the chemistry curriculum, uh, general chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry. I have taught uh, general education courses. So I've taught freshman writing in a liberal arts way. We'll talk a little bit about gen ed as well. Um, I have taught honors students. I have done service learning. I have led students on study abroad. Um, and I have taught medical school. And I have also taught graduate students in STEM, so PhD grad students, how to be professors. So I've taught a lot. Um, I have worked with a lot of students over time, and I've seen it all. Um, part of the reason that I, you know, enjoy being in the role I'm in now is I like be, to be able to look at systems and help students to succeed um, across multiple places, not just in my own classroom. And so, you know, that's that's a great place for me to be here at AU with that. Um, if you attended any sessions that I did for uh, admissions, you got to hear about why I love AU, and maybe we'll talk about that later too. Okay, so um, to get started, this this session description I had sent out because it's a lot of transition. So um, your student that you're supporting, you know, if you're a parent, family member, whatever your role is, um, they have a lot that's going on. And so I really want to be able to give you some some ideas and some upskilling. I am a teacher, so I am going to also teach you a few things to kind of think about. And, um, you know, this is based on what we know about students. So I've got a lot of links within, um, which is why I want to make sure that you have a copy of this. So Julie is going to be sharing this. I'm going to stay here for just a second um, because this does have a link as well. It's a bit.ly uh, slash new eagle 24. And, you know, you might be listening in on uh, in the car, et cetera. You, this link will be shared out later in case you want to click on anything later on and continue to um, explore with your students. So um, the links are available. They will be put in the chat. They will be shared again later, but want to make sure that you have all of the tools as we think through supporting our students in their first year and beyond. All right. So um, I really have kind of four stories that I want to tell you. So um, each each one is in a certain key area. And so we've got kind of four tips um, that really follow along with some stories and some resources. So the first thing to really think about um, is just the vocabulary of higher ed. So college, the college world has a whole different level of um, knowledge, a whole bunch of different words that the students have to get used to. Um, and one thing that I really love about AU is how diverse we are. So our students come from all over. I haven't gotten the final stats yet on the new class, but last year we had 46 countries, 46 states. Um, we have students who are on full financial aid. Um, we have students who don't have any financial aid. We have students who have scholarships. We have students that don't have scholarships. Um, we have students that are athletes. We have students that are in Model UN. We have dancers, poets, musicians, artists, um, computer folks, gamers, all the gambit. And they come from multiple different backgrounds. And so, um, you know, it's helpful to be able to think about what are some of the words that 
are in higher ed. So a few things to just kind of think through, um, you know, this is academic presentation. So in, in all times, it's really important to help our students remember they're here to get a degree. You know, this is this is the main point of what we're doing. Um, and that starts with the faculty and the instructors. So they will have people who are teaching their classes that in they're they're not uh, this is something they're familiar with. You know, they've got had teachers in high school, um, but they will have expert faculty and instructors who are teaching their classes. They might also have some other students that are in the class who help facilitate the learning, um, or they might have an advanced PhD student that is helping them with a seminar, but our faculty are faculty and instructors. They're not taught by other students. So the advisor is their academic advisor that is a key person for our students. Um, our students do have a class that they take that is an, called in the American University Experience that is typically taught by their first year advisor. So they see their first year advisor once a week. So those are just some key terms. And then I do have a link. Um, this is an open source book. When you get a chance to click on these, you can look through the whole thing yourself. It's actually a book called Connections Are Everything. Um, and it's a, a college student's guide to relationship-rich education written by a number of peer, uh, peer educational experts. And one thing that they go through is just different college terms to know. So it might be a good idea to look through this and maybe help your student look through this as well, um, just so they know some of the terms that we use in higher ed. So that's part of upskilling. So I want to make sure I got a chance to share that with you. Um, a few things to just kind of think about that are AU specific as we're looking at this vocabulary of higher ed. Of course, students know what email is, but they need to check it. They need to check their email every day, a few times a day. Maybe not constantly, but they, they need to check their email. A lot of students coming from high school don't do that. Um, they will be messaged with in other ways. In high school, often students are meeting with their teachers every single day. In college, they don't. Um, they might meet with their professors uh, three days a week or two days a week or one day a week. Um, it might be a one Saturday a week, um, not often with first year students, but they're not seeing their faculty as much. And so they need to check their email. Their advisors will communicate by email. Um, especially important for new students. So if your student has not yet checked their AU email, they need to. It has all of the information for registration. Registration started weeks ago. <laughs> and often in the K-12 world, registration takes place in August. There's still time. Don't freak out. But the students need to check their email. Um, so that's that's really an important thing for them. And then, you know, and we have deadlines. Um, you know, we have deadlines. We have requirements from the U.S. Department of Education um, and, you know, through the VA, just a number of different places in higher ed. And so they need to be able to pay attention to different deadlines for different kind of processes. Um, so the the ad drop is when they can change their schedules. Our students can't really change their schedules in October. They need to be able to add classes the first week of the semester. They can drop classes the first week of the semester. If they're taking a class and they're not succeeding um, after a certain amount of time, they can withdraw from the class, which is not the same thing as a drop. Their advisors will help them with this, but this is just part of the vocabulary of higher education. One other thing I just wanted to make sure I, I mentioned is um, you know, in thinking about the the um, the vocabulary of higher education, we do have something that is tuition insurance. It is not paid to us, but it protects your investment. Um, that's something that's done through GradGuard. I put a link here so you can look at that if you need to. Um, it's it is something that my child starts college in a year and he will be having tuition insurance. Um, we have, you never know if your student is, you know, is an honor student, has always gotten straight A's. You never know when there might be a latent mental health issue, um, when there might be a mistake that spirals, a situation, something like that, and then they end up needing to stop out of college for a semester, um, which is okay. It happens. I see these multiple times a week. Um, that's a lot of what comes across my desk as Dean of Undergraduate Education, along with the advisors and the college and school associate deans. Um, but, you know, we really, you you do want to be able to protect the investment in your child's future. So that's some of the, the uh, really important things in higher ed, but that still don't always help you think through how to, the academic supports for your students. So you, just that first lesson is some of the vocabulary and some of the tips um, on, you know, on making sure that you're ready for some of the things that are going to come. All right. So second part 
is just what does it mean to be educated? Um, and this is a great topic that I like to bring up with first year students in class. You know, what's the difference between being educated and just going to school? Um, there's a lot of information that students tell us. There's a great research center. It's the Higher Education Research Institute at, at UCLA. And I, I, I told you I nerd out on things. So um, this is the data from last year. So they do a survey with first year students around the nation and ask them what was most important to you in deciding to go to college. So the nerd part of this is I've been watching this data for about 15 years and just watching the trends uh, and what happens to them as the numbers collapse. And I knew this was gonna happen, number one, um, as of the last year or two, is students go to college because they want to learn more about things that interest them. That is fascinating. That used to be number two, and number one used to be to get a better job. Students are no longer deciding to go to college as their number one reason for getting a better job and for the economic indicators, which we know are huge for students, but they want to learn more about things that interest them. And I say that because at, when things get hard um, and sometimes the, the students feel like, uh, you know, they, they, they don't feel motivated, they don't want to go to class, things like that, just remind them why they're here. Um, this is a great thing to point out to. What is it that interests you? How is it that, um, that you know, this, this class, these, these college experience is something that really helps you develop as a person? Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but number three is also to gain a general education and appreciation of ideas that used to be number four. Um, and now number four is getting training for a specific career. So the other things that do top um, are making more money, which is now number five. Fascinating. Um, preparing for grad or professional school, becoming more cultured or to please my family. That one's actually on the decrease, which is fascinating to me. Um, so only about a third of them are going to college to please their families, which is okay, um, because they need to be able to be motivated and to know the things that they want to do. So I think that research is really interesting as we think about, you know, helping your students start and stay strong academically. Uh, what does it mean to be educated? So the, the pieces that come in, it starts with the curriculum. So the curriculum is the sequence of planned courses where students, you know, practice and achieve proficiency and content and skills. Um, so it's bundles of classes. The curriculum consists of the major course of study that's, that's typically about 90 credit hours. Um, and typically, a, a most courses are three credit hours. So it's typically about 90 hours. Changing majors is OK. This is something that's very important to tell your students. Uh, students at AU don't change majors as much as they do nationally, which really fascinates me. Only about 25% uh, of our students change majors, so 75% don't. Nationally, over half of students change their majors. It's okay. It means that they're finding something else that they're interested in. And, um, you know, I, I am always convinced and I, I see the data. I've got, you know, 1,800 new first-year students to look after every year, you know, close to 8,000 undergrad students total. All students who are admitted to AU will succeed here. Um, there is no reason that they cannot succeed. I, I, I know what I see the data. I know they can succeed. But sometimes they changing majors is something that means that they're then in something that's interest them that they didn't know about ahead of time. So that's a good message to help share with your student if you need to. Our general course of study is our gen ed. At AU, we call that our AU core. Um, it is a, a required part of a curriculum in the United States. It it's what part of it's part of what makes an American education distinctive. Um, and, you know, there are also European models that are based on old Prussian models. But what we're seeing as educational experts uh, is that many countries that have been built on the very focused, narrow ed system of education that does not include a general education, their students can't compete on the global marketplace. Um, so the entire nation of India, for instance, is changing their educational system to include a general ed education component. So that's really important. And so for students, sometimes it might be, why do I have to take this class? You know, I want to major in policy. Why do I need to take a class in math? Well, it's part of your general education. Um, I want to major in math. Why do I need to take a class in the arts? That's a part of your general education. So at AU, our uh, general education is called the AU Core. I'm not going to go through this a whole lot, but the link is embedded. Um, we have three different kinds of core classes, foundation courses, habits of mind, and integrative courses. There's lots of information on the website about this, but it does help the students to understand why they're taking certain courses. So that's typically about 30 hours. 
Um, and then some students will have minors. They might overlap with their majors. Um, some In some majors, they're required to have another minor for additional depth and breadth. Uh, personally, in college, I was a chemistry major with a music minor. What? Okay, it was amazing. I went every Tuesday and Thursday, I went from being in lab all day straight to playing clarinet. Uh, for an hour and a half. And uh, it it helped balance out my brain and it gave me a different group of people to hang out with, one of whom I married and we celebrate our, I got to do the math, 23rd wedding anniversary next week. Um, so, you know, the minors can be really beneficial for students. Many students will also have field work, they'll have capstones, they'll have studios, they'll have other kinds of classes, and all of those go together into a curriculum. So I also included a link to the catalog. Um, it's just catalog.american.edu. Um, when I was back in school, there was no internet. Um, and so we had the paper catalogs. It's the same concept. It's just online now. And I share this with you um, because sometimes families don't know that this exists. So it shows that all of our information is public. This is actually required by the U.S. Department of Education. We would do it anyway, um, but includes lots of information. And then uh, we can also look at the different academic programs. So you can look at every wrong click. Um, you can look at every program for which we have a major, a BA, a Bachelor of Arts, a BS, Bachelor of Science. Um, we have some BFAs, I think, which is a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, we have minors, you name it. It's all here and it tells you exactly what the students need to take. So um, I'm on the D's, I'm going to click on data science. So the the BS, Bachelor of Science in Data Science, is in the College of Arts and Sciences. That's right up here. And it's housed in the Department of Math and Stats. Um, it talks about what the students need to do to be able to graduate. What are the courses that they take? Um, they do have AU core requirements. And then they have 38 credit hours with at least 18 credit hours above the 300 level. It tells exactly what they need to take. So if you want to major in, um, in data science, you start with statistics, you have intermediate statistics, you have ethics, very important. Um, you have communications and online influence, you know, you, electives, lots of different kinds of things. Um, I looked this up earlier. I really want to take this class on stochastic processes. It looks very fun. Um, so everything that we have curriculum wise is in the catalog. So those are some great tools to just know about and help navigate the students to. Again, they have academic advisors that they meet with who help them with these schedules, but it's always good to be able to have these tools. So next thing I really wanted to talk about. So moving on to the third story, and this is my favorite story, um, the story of learning, studying, metacognition, and self-control. Those all three go together. Um, learning happens through neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are both chemical and electrical, and they only work in the brain whenever they make connections. That's incredibly important for learning. Um, but remember, they're chemical and electrical. We're gonna come back to that at the end. So really for students, we wanna think about, um, I'd, I'd like to teach students the tools of metacognition. So we think of it as metacognition is like a giant brain sitting on top of your brain, controlling what your brain does. And so it's metacognition cognition above and beyond. And that's where it, it's really important because studying involves behaviors. Um, it involves actions and behaviors on behalf of our students. And those behaviors can be positive. So some examples, um, when they're learning about and implementing new strategies, they can learn those here. I'm going to talk about those, spoiler alert, in lesson number four. Um, but, you know, they can implement new strategies. I always work with first-year students on teaching them how to read and teaching them how to read with a pen in their hand. So this is an example, a custom textbook I've used in a class before for students. Teach them how to write in the text, you know, underline certain things, write your notes in the side, write your thoughts. Um, that's part of learning. A lot of times students will use things like graphic organizers, where this is very common in classes like biology and health science and government, where they've got lots of different pieces and they have to think about how they have to fit together. Um, so those are some tools that they can use. And so that part of studying is behaviors and choices. Um, forming study groups is a great behavior. We know that students who perform, who join study groups, uh, productive study groups, I should add an adjective in front of that. Um, actually do better. And it's because they're talking about their learning with other people. So behaviors can also be negative, uh, self-defeating. And this is something to just watch out for um, when you're talking to your students. So doubt, doubt happens all the time. 
Um, we off, often look at imposter syndrome. There's tons of information about this if you want to look it up. Um, it's where you feel like everybody else um, belongs and you don't, and they're going to find out. Um, or sometimes negative self-talk. Um, I talk to students about this all the time. If, um, you know, that that you did not fail a test, the score was not where it needed to be. Let's talk about your behaviors. So big takeaway, um, this is so important. This is something reiterate to your students. I, 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 I say this all the time, but I also uh, rephrase a, a uh, former colleague, Sandra McGuire, I've got a uh, reference at the end of this, that there are not smart and not smart students. There are students who have internalized the behaviors that lead to success and those that have not yet done so. Um, and it's really all about their behaviors and their choices. So this is where we get into metacognition a little bit more. So um, I actually did some research several years ago because I am also an educational researcher. My faculty appointment at AU is in the School of Education. I'm a full tenured professor, um, you know, published four papers last year, got I don't even know how many millions of dollars of grant money um, because we know what we're doing. And we're always looking for new ways of learning how to measure uh, learning and growth even more. So this is an example. These are some behaviors. I was working with a collaborator at the University of Georgia, and we looked across a number of gateway courses. So these are typically, um, like when I was in school, we called them killer courses. You know, the look to the left, look to the right. You know, only one of you is going to be here in December kinds of courses. We don't teach like that at AU. Um, I wouldn't work at an institution that did. Um, but what we know is that there are certain kinds of behaviors that correlate and predict student success across multiple gateway courses. So um, not going to not going to give you too much of the, the nerdy parts, but um, there are really two forms of metacognition. There's knowledge of it. So how am I learning? And then there's regulation of it. And that's control. These are the bullet points. These are the things that show that helps students to engage better. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but things like understanding their intellectual strengths and weaknesses. Um, I am really, really organized. And so I know that I cannot sit down and write a paper at, with a blank screen and nothing in front of me. That makes me super nervous. So I start to scribble it all out. And then I will uh, color code and then I will make my outline and then I know what I'm going to write and then I chunk it out and do piece at a piece, piece at a time. So I use my organizational ability to overcome my, uh, I'm going to say fear, maybe that's not it by this point, but, you know, but my anxiety about having a blank page to write. Um, so using intellectual strengths to compensate for weaknesses, knowing what kind of information is most important, knowing what the teacher expects you to learn, um, ask them. This shouldn't be an, an, a surprise. Ask the teacher, what do you want me to learn? They'll tell you. <laughs> um, often they'll have, you know, have slides that say, this is what I want you to learn. They'll post those into Canvas. They'll, they'll do those kinds of things. Um, so the regulation of cognition is how the students are um, con controlling what they're learning and how they're learning it. So this is a great one, you know, spe specific goals before I begin a task. Um, you know, if I am going to sit down for 30 minutes and I am going to do as many uh, calculus problems as I can, um, or I am going to um, read for an hour, or I'm going to read 30 pages of this. And um, I actually have a little timer in my office. I have another one of these on my desk at home that just rotates and it keeps me focused. And then whenever the brain squirrels come in of, oh, I need to answer this email or, oh, you know, this other thing, I say, nope, I'm on the clock. And, you know, you you can, they, these set lots of, you can have them in lots of different um, configurations. I actually got this idea from a fellow math uh, professor. Um, so these are a lot of the very good kinds of strategies that we know work with students. Okay, so, um, you know, and then I also wanted to just, you know, mention that there are no tricks. You know, there there are no shortcuts. Students need to just learn the material. Um, and when they learn the material, you know, the grades take care of themselves. Um, so one of the big differences between college and high school is just the level of academic rigor and cognitive complexity. Um, you know, the I, I have multiple examples of this, but, um, you know, sometimes in before, Pre-college days, you might get a um, an article to read. And in college, you've got a book and you need to read that book in a week. 
Um, so, you know, think about how many pages, what do you need to do? How are you going to pace that out? Um, and the cognitive complexity often means that you're not um, showing that you understand, you're showing that you can make new connections, that you can create knowledge yourself. And, you know, students need to really be able to use their resources and upskill. Um, I have a quote here I'm, that actually comes from, um, also from the book on connections or everything, that students fear failure and being challenged by their limits. They may not have been challenged academically in high school and for the first time are really experiencing academic rigor. Um, they fear they're going to embarrass their families. They fear that that if they talk to a professor, the professor is the font of all knowledge and it's intimidating. Um, they don't want to work with a tutor because it's being perceived as not being smart. Um, they don't want to go to counseling or therapy when they have emotional concerns because they think that's a weakness. And the fear and shame is everywhere. And that's actually a quote that was a first year student, not at AU, but at another institution. Um, and that's where the the ability of students to, you know, to plan ahead, to work on these components really matters. And I told you I was also going to point back to the neurotransmitters. We learn through chemical processes and electrical processes. And those chemical processes can also involve stress hormones. And so you can't learn when you, you're stressed. You can't learn when you're in a state of anxiety. Um, and so, you know, students need to be able to plan and use their resources and use their time. So that's my next lesson. And there are several parts of this because it's an important one. Um, so, you know, it's use your resources and upskill. I mean, everything requires upskilling. Um, I entered an in, into a new job last year here at AU. And so I work with a leadership coach every three weeks to help me learn some new skills to deal with the new challenges. Um, you know, just it, it can help with your student if you pull back the curtain a little bit and share with them some of the other things that you've had to do um, to really learn new skills. So the, the other thing I really like to think about with this topic is um, I, there's a former university president who always told me higher ed is the only place where the consumer demands the minimum. And I don't like referring to students as consumers because we're also an educational institution, but um, you can get by and not use your resources and not do as well. Um, or you can use your resources and do much, much better. So I wanted to get a couple little sections here as we're thinking about resources and upskilling. Um, and the first is why help seeking behaviors matter. So I'm quoting a different book. This is called Be Great, Your Journey is Your Legacy. The, the link is also, or the uh, reference is also at the end. And there are several myths about seeking help. This is a great thing to talk to your student about. Um, there are these myths that, you know, if you seek help, it means you're not smart. You might seem incompetent. You might seem weak. Um, other people are busy. I don't want to bother them. That's not true. <laughs> Um, or I won't need help. None of that is true. So, um, you know, helping bust that myth of um, of help seeking is really an important concept to make sure you talk to your student about before they're starting college. So uh, one of the next pieces is just, um, you know, what we know from academic help seeking behaviors. It impacts students' grades, their self-confidence, and their tenacity. So their ability to overcome setbacks. Um, so data on help-seeking behavior, this is always fascinating to me, and it also ties in with relationships. Um, so students are two times more likely to be thriving personally and professionally, even years after graduation, when they say, I have at least one professor who cares about me as a person and encourages me. Um, I could tell you the name of every single student that I've ever taught um, because I make sure to get their name to know their names. I do the grading myself. Um, you know, I give them good feedback. I help help mold and shape them as individuals. And as I'm molding and shaping, they're pushing back. And that's wonderful. And that's part of what makes education so fascinating. Um, so those relationships with faculty matter. And they say they're three times more likely to say their college time is rewarding um, when they have a handful of meaningful relationships with staff and faculty. Um, every student here has an academic advisor. Um, every student has a number of resources that they can they can have. They have a residence assistant. They will have an orientation advisor who's another student. They will have a peer facilitator. They have a whole constellation of people surrounding them that they can turn to anytime they need it. Um, and that's that's a really beautiful thing. 
So one of the big challenges in college and things to help think about is just adjusting to the schedule. Um, there are 168 hours in every week. You get it. Samantha gets it. I get it. Every, everybody has 168 hours in a week. Um, typically, students will have a first semester schedule of between 12 and 18 hours. We say 15 is about average. Um, and so they've got 15 hours a week that they're essentially in class. And then we have a one to three rule. Um, so we multiply those 15 hours by three, and that's about 45 hours worth of work total that they'll be doing. Okay, that's a full time job, but there are 168 hours in a week. Um, they need to sleep eight hours a night. This is the one thing if I could wave a magic wand at, you know, 11 p.m. every night, I would spread sleepy juice all over campus and let their little dear hearts go to bed. Um, they don't. They, they need to sleep. They still have adolescent brains until they're about 25. Um, and so sleep is incredibly important. So that's, that's one of the biggest pieces. But then it's discipline. Um, one of my favorite things I quote to students is Dr. J, so basketball player Julius Irving. Um, and it's that being a professional is doing the things you want to do at the times you don't want to do them. And it might be, okay, I want to be a journalist, but I want to go play video games. I don't want to work on this class project. Um, I want to um, be a singer, but it's cold and I don't want to go to the practice room. So Dr. J, doing the things you want to do at the times you don't want to do them, that requires a lot of discipline. So we talk about study, but we also talk about things like sleep eating at regular meal times, drinking lots of water. You know, a lot of those pieces come in, um, but adjusting to the schedule is one of the hardest things for students. Um, time management is everything. I didn't put a ton in here because this is something that um, during orientation, we will have a number of our, um, our experts who are working with first year students and, and new transfer students on this, um, but we've got so many tools that can help students with time management, but it's also the time discipline that really matters. So if start helping them figure out how they want to do this. If they want to use apps, um, there are calendars, there are paper calendars, there are things they can do in their phone, there are things they can do in their computers, um, so many different things to be able to look at the time that you have available and where you want to spend that time. I did want to include just a little bit here about shortcuts and specifically academic dishonesty. So um, we cannot talk about um, you know, academic success without at least touching on this, because there really are four major types of academic dishonesty, and it's good to think about, um, because in higher ed, we take this very seriously. Um, students can fail an assignment. They can fail a course. Um, they can be removed from the institution based on academic dishonesty. Um, so it's just a thing to, to make sure that they're aware about and they think about. They will have uh, training about this in classes as well. But there are really four kinds. Um, plagiarism is, you know, improper attribution of ideas that you say are your own. I try to practice this. Um, I'm including citations. You know, here's here's an idea from somebody else that I am appropriating as I'm talking to new families in this webinar. I'm giving you those citations. Um, often when students are plagiarizing, it's because they don't know. And the solution is talk to your professor. Um, improper sharing of test materials. This sometimes happens when students are taking a test at a different time than other students in the class. Um, I did have a case several years ago where um, a student was taking an exam late because she was sick and she was in a room with a bunch of other students who had already taken the exam. The other students in the room were talking about the exam. And what she should have done is said, hey guys, I haven't taken this exam yet. Can you not talk about that? And got up or gotten up and left the room. She didn't. Uh, one of the students in the class later on found out that she hadn't taken the exam yet, did have an honor code policy, who came to me and said, I think this is a problem. I had to report it, and the student ended up getting a lower grade in that class as a result. Um, so, you know, because she she knew she wasn't supposed to be there listening to this information. So it's just an example. Um, collusion, you know, working together to submit work. Um, or using outside sources when not allowed. Um, we had a student recently who was taking an, a test in the testing center and needed a quiet room. And while in that quiet room, decided to pull up a browser and look up all the answers. And, um, you know, we have cameras that watch them when they're in these private rooms. And so, and the student knew that. And that, that was an issue. 
um, and then outsourcing this. In, so this is paying somebody else to do your work. This also includes AI. AI is tricky. Um, the solution is talk to your professor. Um, talk to your professor, plan ahead. So um, these are things to think about in the time of, of college. So if we're thinking about using your resources, using your time well is always really, really important. Um, resource types. So, uh, you know, the, this is also something to kind of think through. So you have people resources, place resources, thing resources. Um, so the people can really be educational. Uh, like I, I'm an educational resource for a lot of people, a personal so how, um, you know, friends to hang out with, go eat in the cafeteria with to blow off steam, um, and then professional and practical. So people that help you get internships, that help you look at your resume. We have people here that do that. Um, the places are where you go for those supports. And then the things are the types of resources that lead to success. So the books, educational supplies, devices, apps, um, LinkedIn, a LinkedIn account, uh, a calendar, oh, a calendar of some sort. Um, and I did want to make sure that I included our academic support services. Um, we have so many academic support services here. They're, they're just everywhere. Um, so I, uh, we do have the ability, all of our students can have tutoring, academic coaching, supplemental instruction. Um, we have a uh, writing center, um, those who need accommodations can work with accommodations. We have a quant support center where students can go in basically any time of the day and get help with math or statistical software. We've got so many different kinds of support that they do not pay extra for. Um, our people in academic support just created a new resource that for students, they will be sharing this extensively um, during orientation. The link is also here. Um, but it tells students kind of when when should they use these. So we have academic coaching. I wish I would have had this when I was in school. Every student can get up to one academic coaching session a week. If we run out of times, so I'll hire more academic coaches. I'll figure it out. Um, but they they can help help the students, you know, at the beginning of the semester, help them get organized um, during midterms and finals, help them think through studying habits. Um, you know, if they receive an academic alert, um, that means that a professor at some point says, oh, I'm, I'm worried about you, you know, typically based on non-attendance, not turning um, assignments in or um, not submitting work that is pa of a passing grade. So our professors will send those academic alerts to the student. It also goes to their academic advisor. The academic advisor follows up. I can look at every student's record and see if they've gotten an academic alert or not. They can go meet with an academic coach and plan to see how they can do better. Um, the writing center, free, available. Um, and our writing center will work with students earlier on in assignments as well, not just editing. You can, we've got software for that now. Um, the writing center will help students think through their ideas and help them, um, you know, ask them the questions to where they can come up with their outlines and how they want to, to do these. Um, so, you know, two weeks in advance of a major assignment, um, if they're struggling, you know, to review professors' feedback between drafts, great things to use. Um, supplemental instruction. So these are um, in what we call kind of gateway courses, those killer courses, as they used to be called, um, the courses where students sometimes need a little bit more help. Um, we embed tutors into the class. The faculty members request these. Um, and the, the supplemental instructors hold extra group tutoring sessions outside of class. Um, you know, so they can, you know, go during class, uh, attend weekly sessions, um, attend during finals and, and midterms. Great resource. Um, I've taught organic chemistry forever, you know, arguably the most feared course on any college campus. And I could tell which students were going to do best in the class by those who would attend supplemental instruction every week or two um, because they got a chance to work problems on the board with other people and talk them out and really participate in the learning process to a full extent. Um, peer supported to peer assisted student support, it's tutoring, basically. Um, so we have tutors available that will work with students, you know best times to see them when they're struggling with content to create study plans, reviewing practice. Um, we have a suite in Butler 300. It's um, very centrally located. All students are, are walking through there all the time as they're going to get coffee and all these different kinds of things. So we have so many different supports available for our students. And that's just one example of when they can be utilized. Um, so, you know, becoming a better learner um, is just another piece of 
the resources. And and there's a, a great little quote um, from a, just a, a small book, uh, Robert Lemonson, who's at the University of Georgia. It's Learning Your First Job. And I love this because it's so true that learning isn't something that just happens to you. It's something that you do to yourself. Uh, you cannot be given learning. You cannot be forced to do it. The most brilliant and inspired teacher cannot cause you to learn. Only you can do that. Um, I wish I could, you know, spread the sleepy juice so they'd all go to bed at a, at a decent time. And um, I wish I could have every student have better learning habits, but I can't. Uh, that's actually part of what I do as a professor and as an academic leader. Um, so we want our students to be able to have these upskilling. So, um, you know, the overcoming obstacles is something that matters and navigating failure. This is little f. Um, there is no failure. There are learning opportunities. Um, I failed, big F, my first college chemistry test. What? I got a 57. It is in this filing cabinet over here next to me. Um, and it wasn't that F. It was what I did after that F. I was surprised. I went and talked to my professor and I said, uh, as many students have to me over time, uh, Dr. Seabach, I studied. I don't know what happened. And he said, how did you study? I said, I read the book. It made sense. I made a nice little outline and I came to class to take the test. And he said, okay, but did you do any of the problems that were in the book that were throughout the text that were at the end of the chapters? Um, because that's what shows up on tests. I said, no, I didn't do those. He said, we'll do those problems. And I did. And it was fine. And I went on to get a PhD in chemistry. Um, but so many people have different failure stories. And it's it, the, and I say this to students all the time, um, your grades have nothing to do with your value as a human being. They give you data. It, it, it's data on your learning and your efforts, and it gives you data to know where to put your time the next time that you have an assignment. Um, and so that's something to start maybe working with your student on is um, what is the narrative that you're going to give them? They're, they're going to struggle a little bit, even if they have a 4.0 their first semester, which a lot of students do, because we have some smart cookies here who work really hard, um, you know, but what to do when things don't go as planned. So helping the students over that. Um, you know, the in class and between classes, it's, you know, the this idea of taking notes is a myth. They don't take notes. They make notes. Um, it's a record of the learning time. Um, thoughts have to be in words in order for us to make sense of them. That's how our brain literally makes connections between neurons. Um, and then we need to be able to have iterative use of our learning records. So short writing, free writing, mapping, outlining, solving problems. Our academic coaches will help students learn how to do these things, um, but as will their academic advisors, their professors, office hours, working with peer tutors, everyone else. Um, those are things that they need to do in class and between classes. Where are the ideas? How am I going to take this, these, these concepts and put them in my long-term memory? Outside of class office hours. Every professor has office hours. They have multiple office hours a week. Um, I, I uh, had a lunch for a number of students in January because I wanted to you know, pick their brains and see how things were going. And one of them said, oh, is it okay if I leave 30 minutes early? I want to get to my professor's office hours. And I said, yes, that's exactly what we want you to do. Um, so go, go early in the semester, attend those supplemental instruction sessions, work with tutors, peer facilitators, academic coach, go to the writing center, form a study group. There's talk, talk with the students on your hall about what you're learning. Um, about a third of our students are in university college and other students in university college are in the same complex problems classes as them. Talk to the other people who are in your class. Um, that, that is a really valuable behavior and helps them become better learners. Um, the office hours thing really matters. Uh, new students who go to office hours in the first three weeks of the semester, more likely than their peers to be successful academically. And this is research across a number of institutions in higher ed. Um, last little story. Okay. And then I, I know there are probably some questions that are in the chat and I, you all had some ahead of time. I think I've covered a lot of, um, you know, but just holistic wellness um, as part of academic success, our students have got to get involved. They've got to try some new clubs, try some new things, meet people. Um, this requires openness and exploration. And I'll say this to those of you who have um, students who are kind of 18 year olds, they're part of a micro generation called Gen P. So this is still emerging research, um, but students who were sophomores in high school um, down to sixth graders in 2020, 
um, how, or this micro generation of Gen P. I have one of those. I have a 17 year old child. I am you. I know exactly what you're you're going through. Um, and the they uh, often are more anxious socially about making new groups, establishing relationships, um, social media, cancel culture, all of these different kinds of things. Talk to them about that. Um, there are four four reasons that students don't stay in college: academics, which all students here can be successful. We have so many tools. Um, mental health issues, stay on top of that. Talk to them. The holistic wellness is, is an important part. Finances, uh, college is not cheap. I, I, I hate that, you know, um, but being able to have, have good financial wellness is important. Um, and then the last is just this belonging and fit. And that's the one that breaks my heart every time. Um, I've had so many students sit in my office over the years. Oh, Dr. Trogdon, I'm lonely. And I wish they knew Everybody feels like that sometimes. Um, but, you know, being able to get involved and build relationships matters. And then, you know, these 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 skills, you know, conflict management, um, it's going to happen. Little small things with their roommates. Um, I, I had a fight with my college roommate once in the middle of the night where we were screaming at each other. And, you know, she's one of my best friends now. You know, I watched her kids the other day while they came up and went to a Nats game. Um, so conflict management, boundaries, self-care, rewards, reward yourself when you do well. Um, when I was a sophomore, every time after I had an organic chemistry test, I would sit down, I learned to cross stitch. I would, I would cross stitch. Uh, we have students on the quad that will sit and play guitar. So what are the things that they're doing? Those are all incredibly important. Um, just put again, copy of this presentation and links, um, references are at the end, along with a picture of some of the books I've held up. Um, lots of different references if you want to look at any of those. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and um, we can take a few questions if Samantha will help out. Thank you, Dr. Prodden. Um, What a great presentation. I also have a college rising sophomore at another institution. So I was in everyone's shoes just last summer with a, an incoming student and all of these topics and themes and resources still drive home even beyond the freshman year. Yep. So thank yep. you for that. Sure. So um, one, oh, go ahead. Oh, one of the questions that we're getting is, um, are there uh, ways that the students are going to learn this important information? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, they've already been working with their academic advisors on registration courses, um, the things I talked about, about, you know, uh, um, education and going to school. Um, whenever they uh, they come for orientation, um, we have for our students a four day orientation um, that starts. Say I've got August 26th on the brain because that's the first day of class. Um, but the orientation will be starting right after move in. So for most students on the 20th, um, those who are in living learning communities and other cohorts on the on the 19th, your students should have gotten information about this. Um, but we are taking them through four days of lots of different activities. Um, and either on uh, Wednesday morning or Thursday morning, so August 21st or 22nd, every student will have a chance to talk with our academic supports area about these exact resources. Um, very in in uh, and many of the students who work as tutors, as peer instructors, supplemental instructors will be there as well. Um, so yes, absolutely, they will get all of those. I wanted to talk to you all kind of as parents, um, just because otherwise you might be missing some of this information during move-in. And Samantha's told me this, but there are Dr. Trogdon's got a lot of seminars over the next month with the with the thing. So, you know, Samantha will keep me honest. But um, during move in, there's a parent, small parent orientation as well. And you'll get a chance with me and with our provost, who is the chief academic officer, uh, Provost Vicki Wilkins, um, to just do a little bit of a lighter version of, of this as well. But absolutely, the resources um, are going to students. So I'm going to check that off because we answered those live. Um, so the uh, I, I saw something as well um, about, you know, students and books. So um, the students books are there's actually a higher education act where the books are required um, to be published. And we do that through our bookstore. Students do not have to buy their books in our bookstore. Um, but it will give students the list of books and materials that they need for class. And it is helpful to get those ahead of time um, as much as you can. So um, so I saw that. Can, and the, can they use e-reader editions of books instead of ordering hard copies? Um, 
I would ask the professor for their classes. Um, if if you you know the student schedules should say who the professors are. If it just says staff, it's just because we're still you know figuring out some of the little pieces. Um, but the professors will will let them know um, different ways of doing that. Um, honor students, they have an honors advisor. It's not a separate advisor, um, but they do have additional um, honors advisors who work with them whenever they need to. That's something that's part of my portfolio. So they do have that option as well. Other things, Samantha? I think you covered much of the questions on the school supply list beyond a laptop. Are there any academic pieces? You talked about books. Are there That's such books? a good question. Um, I mean, I there's a, a lot of the those tools would be the same kinds of things that they would need for um, for high school, you know, notebooks, papers, pens, et cetera. Um, you know, in in second and third grade, you're told exactly what kind of notebook. Professors don't do that. Um, but it's, you know, there's lots of studies that uh, taking notes by hand is very beneficial for students. Um, but, you know, they they just need the typical papers, folders, notebook kinds of things. They do need, they do need a laptop um, or some kind of computer or tablet um, and, you know, Mac PC, it really doesn't matter. Um, sometimes if they have a specific major, um, they they might want to have something with a different kind of graphics package, but that would actually be, I, I don't know that I can fully answer that. Maybe Samantha, we can, you know, make sure that um, that information is shared. Um, there were a couple questions that, that came in. I, I grouped all of the questions that had been sent in and I tried to check a lot of them off because in general they were you know, supporting my student, supporting my student, supporting my student. Um, your your job is shifting um, to being kind of the the coach, the guide on the side. Um, there were several people in here who said, "How do they fill out a paper to get access to their students' grades?" Um, we don't do that. Um, we do have the ability to have some waivers. I'm not going to talk about that now, but I know it's it's in other places um, where you know we are allowed to, you know, answer questions that you might have about students, but um, you need to talk to them. And I think that one of the other questions that I saw several times is, you know, how involved should the parent be in the child's college academics? Um, how much should I be involved versus stepping back and watching? Um, you want to ask the questions, you know, and, and maybe talk with your student ahead of time about, um, you know, what how you're going to talk to them and how you're going to support them. Um, having a 17 year old boy is not always easy because I'll ask and I'll ask the questions. And sometimes it's mom, what do you want to know? And I say, I am asking because I'm interested in your life and I want to, um, you know, be able to give you some additional tools and expertise as I can. Um, and so, you know, being able to have those conversations with your, your student about, um, how they want you to be involved is is helpful. They are going to call you sometimes and speak in hyperbole. Um, oh, I hate blah, blah, blah. My professor, blah, blah, blah. You really don't need to intervene. <laughs> um, a, a lot of times they're blowing off steam, but you know your child better, better than a lot of other people. So, um, you know, the places to intervene are, um, there's, there's a difference between struggle and suffer. And if, if you can help your child realize struggle is part of learning, um, suffering is a different category. Um, and it's just, it's really, really tricky at that point. So in the interest of time, I think that you've covered so many of the questions that we got in advance and much of what we got in the chat. We're now at 7.59 and I think it's time for us to wrap up our session this evening. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Trogdon. Thank you so much for sharing both American University resources, external resources, and lots of research that we can dig into as parents. Yes. Thank if you, you wish. Families, for joining it's okay. Us. But yes, yeah. if, if we wish to go a little yes. bit deeper. And, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible during move in. Um, and I, I didn't say this, but my office is literally in first year housing. This is the Anderson Let's Quad out here. Um, I and my staff have our eyes on 1,800 first-year students all day, every day. 
Um, and I, I love it. I have first year student that lives above me, a first year student that lives below me. They're going to be getting some cookies um, whenever class starts just to let them know that Dean Trogdon is their downstairs or upstairs neighbor. Um, but we care very, very much about your students. And this is why we do what we do. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. We will be sending the recording with the um, resource presentation with links via email. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again on screen and hopefully in a few weeks in person. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.